Hi, welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I'm Rob Penzak, and my co-host today is Larry Mendoza. Larry, who do you have with us? Oh, we have a special guest today, one that I'm very excited to have. Uh, his name is John Shook. And uh, just let me do a little quick introduction. Um, he is the education coordinator uh, for the American Humanist Association, as well as the director of education and senior research fellow uh, for the Center of Inquiry. He's also a co-mentor with the Humanist Institute and president of the Society for Humanist Philosophers. Uh, on the academic side, uh, uh, from 2000 to about 2006, he was professor of philosophy at Oklahoma State University, and in 2006 became a research associate in philosophy and faculty member of the Science and the Public uh, Master's Online Program for the University at Buff uh, Buffalo uh, in New York. So he's written a number of books, uh, one of his latest one being uh, The God Debates, um, A 21st Century Guide for Atheists and Believers. And I think we're going to start with maybe talking a little bit about that. Oh, sure. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for yeah, having me. We're very happy to have you here. Maybe you can start, just tell us a few words about the Center of Inquiry. I saw on your website um, there, you have a bunch of kind of very important papers where scientists are telling us and taking stands yes, on things that's like right. acupuncture, um, right. You know, ethics of genetic engineering, forgotten country, global climate change. Important topics. Right. How, how do you feel about scientists really taking a stand, you know, not just staying in their own academic thing, but talking sure, to the sure. public? Well, scientists are absolutely invaluable, not just for finding out what we need to know about the world, but for trying to communicate it to the public. And the Center for Inquiry, like other secular organizations, is very grateful to scientists who will speak out, who will speak to conferences, and who will try to communicate to all of us what science is telling us about the world. The Center for Inquiry has an office for public policy, which is responsible for generating many of the reports that can be found at centerforinquiry.net. And I also work for the American Humanist Association, which is similarly devoted to reason, science, skepticism, humanist values, and trying to defend separation of church and state. OK. Um, you know, one thing that I saw in the God debates, you talk about how debates do have a winner and a loser, but that the real winner of the thing is the learner who's paying attention, we hope. just trying to get a deeper <laughs> understanding. Maybe you can talk about that in the context of some professional apologists, where their goal isn't exactly to have an exchange of information. I've met some um, of those, so yes. Tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, I've had encounters <laughs> with uh, uh, academic theologians, uh, some of whom are actually interested in dialogue, and some of whom get a bit preachy. But my role simply is to show that these things are intellectually debatable. That's actually the main goal. Uh, people ask, why do you bother? You're not going to persuade a Christian in the audience to suddenly surrender God. Well, maybe not suddenly. Things take time, as we know. Furthermore, we have to show that religion ought to be publicly debated with reason. Uh, what's the alternative? We remain silent, or we only have our wit and sarcasm, which can be very devastating. But no, we can uh, hold ourselves to high standards of uh, uh, intellectual debate and academic knowledge uh, as well. And I think that's very important for the public engagement of religion. Okay. Now maybe we can start with one of those apologists who yes. I don't think uh, takes the intellectual sharing to heart. But if you can roll that first video with uh, John Shook debating William Lane Craig. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event called the Big Bang. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. Historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did really rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, over there we see William Lane Craig starting off by co-opting the Big Bang Theory, That's right? That's right. Um, you know, so they start with the science that they would fight tooth and nail until they, it's too yeah, embarrassing to fight it. Funny how theology suddenly loves science, right, and, and when it's convenient. 
Right? And then he ends with what you, I think, would call the argument of pseudo-history, where, well, if there was a divine miracle, we have proof of a divinity. That's so, a real big I, if. Yeah, so I don't know. How, how do you debate somebody <laughs> like that with a straight face? And how do you distinguish between him and somebody in the audience who's really trying well, to learn? Well, sure. Uh, we need to be able to tell the whole scientific story. William Lane Craig gets away with what he does because he only tells half-truths. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Big Bang is quite real. Theology can take no credit for it. That was a scientific discovery. But what Craig uh, didn't tell you, and perhaps couldn't even at the time, was that the Big Bang had natural causes. Cosmologists are not sure about what those natural mm -hmm. causes are. In 100 years, they may not still be sure. But there is apparently enough evidence about what we do know from cos cosmic background radiation and how the Big Bang uh, would have happened that it's looking possible that there was more, uh, perhaps at the quantum level, universe in the biggest sense uh, before our own little corner of the universe inflated into what we can visibly see. Don't count out science's ability to find more natural causes as explanations. Craig just simply stops at Big Bang, therefore you need a supernatural creator. Way too fast. Uh, what we need to do is, of course, give scientists time to find out. Keep in mind, it was only maybe a couple hundred years ago that the intellectual world figured that we were the only planet in existence. And look how far we've come. So these things are too soon to judge. And as for the resurrection of Jesus, if you take the Bible literally, you have evidence. But of course, uh, real history uh, has no longer uh, taken the Bible seriously as a, as, a, as a source of reliable information about the past. So this is kind of interesting for me because I think this is kind of falls into the whole line of evidential apologet That's apologetics right. and the That's natural right. theology or, or nat natural apologetics that people like William Lane Craig, but others like Frank Turek likes to use yes. the same argument. I remember, um, you know, my uh, student group when I was down in Virginia Commonwealth University, we organized the first um, Hitchens and uh, Frank Turek debate. And one of the things that Frank Turek, which is a gr he's a great public speaker, he's a, you know, you, you could sit down and have a beer with the guy, but the first thing he said goes, yeah, sure, Big Bang happened. We just know who banged it, you know? And, and it's, it's uh, but it's kind of this line of evidential apologetics that I think a lot of philosophers and, and even scientists have been trying to, to kind of um, debate against. It's, it's how do we you know, kill, kill that? And so that's right. been working pretty well, I think. What, what are your thoughts? Well, the academics have always been divided between the fundamentalists mm -hmm. who just throw up all kinds of objections to science, trying to demote it and show that it can't know hardly anything. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the academic theologians who take science most seriously and try, as you say, to use this uh, as evidence that there really is something supernatural out there responsible for all of this. Fundamentalism never has to update itself. Mm -hmm. Fundamentalism story always remains the same. We have the literal truth. The scriptures tells us what is so. And if you hear differently, it's the work of the devil. So sure. fundamentalism can keep its story straight. Mm -hmm. Natural theology that has to rely on the actual uh, knowledge of nature as science discovers it has to keep updating itself right. because science's uh, story continues to update itself. A situation uh, not unfamiliar to philosophy, philosophy also has to update itself and update its grand naturalistic story about the world based on the best scientific theories of the day. So curiously enough, both natural theology and philosophy uh, are in this chess match where we're trying to use the latest knowledge of science. The question remaining is, who does it more rationally and the most skeptically? And uh, uh, who can refrain from extravagant uh, supernatural hypotheses? Well, the, the philosophical naturalists do that. Natural theology always overreaches itself. Mm -hmm. I think All right. Yeah, and, uh, let's go to our second video clip which uh, deals with the issue we talk about constantly, morality amongst you know, humanists or atheists, and does this have to come from sacred scripture? So let's see what William Lane Craig uh, does on that one. On the relativistic view, the psychopath who considers it a good thing to rape and kill little children does nothing wrong. For relative to his personal goals and desires, this is what he should do. A society like Nazi Germany cannot be condemned for sending millions of Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals to the gas chambers for, according to their value system, this was good. Dr. Shook admits, and I quote, nothing in the natural world, 
such as human beings, human societies, human life on earth, can be responsible for absolute moral truths. It follows that they must be grounded in a supernatural reality. So we may argue as follows. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective moral values do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. So is that the point where you conceded the debate that uh, he no, had won? No, 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 no. <laughs> People listening carefully, and you can find that on the YouTube as well, will notice that it's a fallacious argument because he begins by talking about absolute morality, and then he starts talking about objective morality. A philosopher would notice the difference. You should too. The difference is this. When Craig means absolute, he means something not only universally true for all of humanity, but it can never change. That is to say, it's impossible to conceive of otherwise. It's fixed and final for all times. Well, fundamentalists talk in that terms. Conservative Protestant theologians like William Lane Craig are comfortable in those terms. I believe objective morality exists, and it's improvable with increases to human knowledge. What we know about human nature, thanks to evolution and anthropology, what we know about what we can do to have moral societies, what we know we can do about having democratic governments that respect human rights. Humanity didn't know about these things 5,000 years ago, but that doesn't make Craig right and me wrong. It means yeah. that there is an objective morality and we're learning how to develop more of it. What mm -hmm. we need is more and in better uh, uh, ethics. Perfectly objective, we believe that these basic human rights are universal for all of humanity. But they may have to be supplemented. They may have to be revised in light of future technologies and new forms of life that humanity or other species that evolve from us. So change is possible, but I think change and improvement frightens conservative thinkers, uh, religious people like William Lane Craig. They want to find all of morality in the past. And I think uh, humanity has to say no. The past is where ignorance, barbarism, cruelty, and violations of human rights is. And if that's where William Lane Craig wants to live, well, that's his choice. But I don't think the rest of humanity wants to go there with him. Well, speaking of ignorance and barbarism, I think we have Rick Wingo, <laughs> one of our hosts on the show, no, no, uh, no. ready to give us a Skype call. So uh, Rick, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Um, hi, guys. Uh, hi, Rick. I could be in there with you today. Um, Apologism uh, is such a great subject. It's so funny when we hear the religious adopting science and trying to use it against us. One thing I learned about apologism a long time ago is that they, to make it work, they have to assume what it is they're trying to prove. As you mentioned, the three steps, or what uh, Dr. Craig was talking about, the three steps, if God doesn't exist, then there's no objective morality. Since there is objective morality, God must exist two steps actually. But uh, in my view, apologism is the claim. It's not the proof. They try to set up, and Dr. Craig is very famous for this, trying up to set up a series of hurdles to tailor the argument so that only he can win, so that the other debater cannot possibly win. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to watch people, uh, when they debate him, Hitchens was great, and uh, Sam, um, um, I'm sorry, I just forgot his name. Sam Harris. Harris. Who just, <laughs> right. Who just ignore him and barge right on and set up hurdles for him. Mm -hmm. And then, too, the Big Bang. It's funny that they've now adopted that, but, you know, the only thing before the Big Bang was God. Well, what seems apparent is that before the Big Bang, there was actually quite a bit of raw material in some form or another. So whole area for study there, and I'm sure people are looking at it. Real scientists doing real science. Mm -hmm. No, and that's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, sp speaking of like, you know, going back to like objective morality a little bit, would you, and speaking of Sam Harris, as, as Rick uh, mentioned, um, I don't know if you've read his book, oh, The Moral course. Landscape. I've and, interviewed and him about did it. Did you? Right. Sure. So what, what did you think about that? I mean, he makes the case oh. that objective morality is a scientific uh, 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 attribute and can actually be studied and science can actually dictate moral values. Well, what anything do you think about that? that yeah. human beings do can be objectively studied mm -hmm. by science. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, Sam Harris is, of course, on the cutting edge of where anthropologists, sociologists, cognitive scientists need to go. So he is the harbinger and, and uh, a very eloquent forerunner of that very important work. Mm -hmm. Good, good, yeah, because, um, you know, I thought, I know his book has, uh, you know, he's been, it's been a little bit, uh, stirring up a little bit of controversy amongst some philosophers. It wouldn't be and, Sam Harris if it wasn't controversy. <laughs> that's right. It's good. Um, can, can we jump into something uh, that I was doing a little bit of background reading for this? Tell us a little bit about neurotheology and what we're learning uh, about the brain and where all these thoughts come from. Well, among the many sciences discovering how the brain works, neuroscience is discovering what the brain is like on religion. So why are religious people religious? Why does religiosity take the certain forms that it does? Where do mystical experiences come from? Why do people in India have visions and communications with Krishna, whereas in America, they'll say it was Jesus talking to them? Well, obviously, there's a combination of some sort of natural aptitude for elevating experiences, and you can actually see the brain scans of the brain encountering uh, awesome, terrifying, uh, deeply inspiring meditative experiences, perhaps, all sorts of experiences. And of course, it is the brain responsible for all of these things. But we can't forget that there's a layer of culture. There's a reason why North Americans would interpret their experience as something coming in a Christian way, sure. whereas someone in India would interpret it very differently. But nevertheless, we can learn an awful lot about people and why they're prone to religion and why certain kinds of experiences seem very compelling to them. Mm -hmm. But in the end, this is a story about them and their brains. Some theologians hope for a proof of God to be coming from this, but I'm skeptical. <laughs> well, I can just see them sort of claiming, you know, as you figure out the neural circuitry that leads to these religious feelings or transcendent feelings, just like they want to co-opt the Big Bang, and you'll talk about later how they try to co-opt even evolution yes. that they fought against. It wasn't God right. smart to create himself through temporal lobe epilepsy. That was God doing that. Correct. Um, Correct. Well, and I think science is helping us understand that it is unnecessary to view religion as only brain malfunctioning, mm -hmm. as only somehow bad wiring or brain trauma or an illness or something like that. Doubtless those have been interpreted religiously, but anyone can have these sorts of experiences under certain circumstances. Sleep deprivation will do it. Uh, there are certain mm -hmm. substances you can ingest that sure. might help along the way, as uh, many religions know. The point, rather, is that theology needs to interpret the brain's capacity to have these experiences as mm, something like an antenna, a part of the brain that seems, seems to be responsible for tuning into something going on outside of the brain. Mm -hmm. And theology says, well, we know what that antenna is tuning into. It's God, right? right? Well, that's a theological speculation mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be uh, skeptically questioned. Right. And some of the really cool stuff I came across, I'll, I'm going to forget the parts of the brain, but like on the right side, um, where you might figure out your general spatial awareness, and on the left side, whether or not it applies to you. Mm -hmm. And if you suppress one of those circuits, then you might you know, all of a sudden you think it's something is disconnected from you. So if you're hearing a voice or getting some, you know, sensation, but we're really starting to map all that stuff out. And I think it's important that scientists and uh, neuroscientists come in and help explain that to all of us and you know, to the public and not just let the next apologist come in and say, yes, isn't God wonderful how he programmed this, um, you know, and move on. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Good, good. No, that's, um, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, the more we're, we learn about the brain, the more I think we're going to be able to hash out. And I think neuroscience right now is at set very early stages. And I think, uh, but even even at the early stages that it's in, it's, we're already figuring a lot of things out. Um, and and I'm pretty, you know, I, I would go out on a limb and say I'm pretty certain that theologians are not going to find the answer they're looking for in neuroscience. But they're going to try, and as they always do. They will do. try, and they will try very um, hard. And, and I do want to, and you know, after we come back from our break here in a little bit, I do want to get into a little bit of what they're doing um, Yes, they that. have so, some so, new scientific so, results. Yeah, they have some new scientific results. We'll talk about that a little later. But, um, and we also, we're going to have some call-in line is going to be open. We can maybe put the number up and people can start calling in. Um, and also, I think we had an email on tap that we could uh, read and see what somebody had asked us a question, I believe. All 
It says, hey, <laughs> atheists, if God doesn't exist, who wrote the Bible? Checkmate, idiots. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so who, who wrote the Bible there, Dr. Well, human beings God. wrote the Bible. And in fact, going back to both a Jewish theological scholarship responsible for correctly interpreting the Old Testament and Christian theological scholarship, it was these religious scholars who actually picked up the clues and found out that, in fact, uh, it was human beings that were certainly doing the editing, the collating, the deciding what's in the Bible, what's out of the Bible. At one point, there's conclaves of bishops voting books out of the Bible. So human beings certainly uh, w w decided uh, what every word was going to be that was in the Bible. They, they still claim that, of course, God inspired it all. But at that point now, you're into a theological uh, speculation for in which there's no evidence. Inspired a series of infallible human beings to democratically vote on <laughs> yeah. what goes into their that, uh, That's the text. story. Uh, yeah, very, very dubious, especially after you look seriously at the decisions that were made. Many of the decisions about which books of the Bible are in and which are out have mostly to do with the politics of mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the late Roman Empire and, and into the, uh, the Dark Ages of who would control what and which theological interpretation would favor which party of powerful bishops. Uh, mm -hmm. These were human beings making human decisions. And oh, go ahead. No, I was going to just ask, how do uh, most apologists view that now? I mean, is, are they, most of them are taking, I know there's different schools and different types and there's different um, um, you know, just thought processes that goes along with this. But where do most people say, I mean, is it fairly accepted within theological circles that the book was actually written by men? I mean, are there people still trying to, Oh, uh, well, it is said that many atheists come out of the seminaries. But the mm -hmm. seminaries, of course, <laughs> still do encourage the belief that at some point uh, uh, divine revelations were guiding uh, human beings mm -hmm. composing mm -hmm. uh, the Bible, no matter how much it got chopped up later. The hot work lately is whether or not Jesus existed. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. been a hotbed of uh, non-religious scholarship, uh, uh, Bart Ehrman, for mm -hmm. example, yep. um, uh, Robert Price, mm -hmm. Richard Carrier's out with a new book. And these authors are dissecting the claim that not only did Jesus really exist, uh, perhaps, uh, there's sure. reasons to be skeptical, but, but perhaps, and did Jesus really do any of the famous things that he's credited for doing in the New Testament? Here, real history, that is to say scientific history, has to be extremely skeptical towards the faith healings. Although Jesus may have been a faith healer in our modern sense of bamboozling people with some good tricks, did Jesus actually show up in Jerusalem and cause trouble at the temple and get Herod and Pontius Pilate interested in his existence? No, almost certainly not. There's no evidence for that. But there is interesting scholarship being done on the question of to what degree can we learn about what a real Jesus, a real mm -hmm. human sure. Jesus, sure. may have been able to do. And, um, uh, you know, Christianity started for certain reasons, and it would be nice to have a better scientific understanding sure. for those reasons, certainly. Sure. Yeah, um, I think in a similar vein, or, well, we'll cut away in just a minute. Okay, sure. um, you know, I was brought up Jewish, although my parents are also, you know, mm -hmm. fairly uh, liberal. But just learning about the stories in the Ten Commandments, it looks like Moses may not have been a historical figure. That's very tenuous, and the Jews probably were not enslaved by Egypt in building the pyramids. That, you know, probably wasn't done with slave labor. But out there in the popular culture, I think most people still do assume that that is history as opposed to a fabrication by people that had a political agenda to accomplish with their um, new Sure, religion. sure. Well, it hasn't been accepted as history in actual academic history departments in about, oh, over, uh, over 120 years. So, the, you know, that, that's long past. Uh, a fellow like William Lane Craig can say, Bible historians accept the resurrection of Jesus. Well, yeah, Bible historians at Bible colleges, maybe. But serious academic history has right. not been doing that sort of thing. Yeah, we need historians coming out and telling us more about that, too. Not just scientists speaking out, but sure. historians laying out what all their evidence has shown. And there's a lot of people working on that. But on that note, uh, why don't we understand that we're going to have some uh, calls in. So uh, can we uh, patch somebody through? Oh, our producer's saying nobody's calling in just yet, so we'll continue on, and then uh, they'll let us know when, when somebody's calling in. How about anything um, on the re relationship between authoritarianism and religion and how that's playing out in the brain? Do you have uh, 
you know, anything? Have well, I would encourage folks to look into the latest research by Jonathan Haidt and um, uh, fellow researchers, H-A-I-D-T. And Jonathan is studying the phenomenon of the difference between what might be called liberal and conservative brains. Now, those labels bring to mind political values. But it's a reshaping of the study of temperament and personality, the old introvert-extrovert distinction, closed-minded, open-minded, and various sorts of types of uh, uh, categorizing of people. And there are some general broad types. And that science has been around for a while. Perhaps this can be correlated with the kind of religiosity people enjoy. So for example, it would make sense that a more, quote, conservative brain would feel most at home in a more conservative religion. Mm -hmm. Now, although the studies uh, haven't been going on for a very long time, they are, in fact, as expected, finding precisely those sorts of correlations. And uh, that's not surprising, because people seek out things that are consistent with their temperament, personality, cognitive style, and those sorts of things. And you told me something very interesting before the show about um, in terms of percentages of people that believe or don't believe you know, in God and what degrees, but a lot of like hard science people and math, like how, how do those fall out in terms of if you have that, what is a conservative mindset, what fields of academia does it lead you into? Right, right, right. Well, the usual thing that you've heard is most scientists are non-religious. Mm -hmm. well, that's actually factually false. <laughs> if you look at people getting PhDs, uh, uh, masters and PhDs in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, they aren't that different from the general background population of the country that they're living in. But after they get into careers, publish, get tenure, then you take a poll. Religiosity has diminished among that smaller segment. Once you get to very prominent scientists, scientists with international renown, fellows of the National Academies of Science, that's where you see those figures of less than 10% are still uh, religious believers. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a strong correlation with scientific success and religiosity, not merely being interested in science. Right. Good. So we got a couple minutes before we go to break. I do want to show there's one more. Um, I, I kind of want to bring the conversation back to your book, uh, The God Debates, a 21st century guide for atheists and believers and everyone in between. Everyone in between. And, and I just want to show the third clip uh, with William Lane Craig. Oh, and maybe Craig just again. kind of maybe, you know, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what he has to say here and then we'll, we'll have a quick discussion. We'll go on break. Dr. Craig claimed, well, I must be right because he can't prove me false. You see, we have this sort of schoolyard juvenile logic operating here and I think we're adults. Now, <laughs> your stockbroker said, well, why are you so hesitant to invest money in the stock market? After all, you can't prove that the stock market won't go up. Should you say, well, come a day, I'm getting rich. I can't prove <laughs> the stock market isn't going up. I'm going to get rich. Come on, Dr. Look, Dr. Shook. That's, uh, Dr. that's Shook. unwise. Let, Dr. Shook, please. Let, look, let's be serious. The point is... The, the, the point... No, my favorite part in that clip is when he says, let's get serious, everybody laughs at him. So I wanted to interpret that as, uh, you know, in one way. I don't know if, if they were laughing at Craig, him for Craig that. at that point was very uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> later, he blogged about this, saying he had the most hostile crowd. That was a large university auditorium filled, by the way, with mostly Christians. Mm -hmm. Most hostile crowd. Well, uh, yeah, I, I had them in my pocket, and they were applauding mostly for me by the end of that debate. But you can judge for yourself on YouTube. <laughs> uh, Craig is interested in this argument that if you can't prove that God doesn't exist, uh, shut up, sit down, quit calling yourself an atheist, because atheists are the ones who think that they can prove something about the supernatural as if somehow we were making the extravagant claims about God. Well, it's the religious people making the extravagant claims to know God exists, not us. But that's sort of the theological games that William Lane Craig is reduced uh, to playing. They can't prove God exists either. The problem is, skeptically, when neither side can prove their case, the default is a kind of, well, the agnostics would say we win. But that is the core of atheism, right. of course. Skepticism towards claims about the supernatural and an inability to believe. That's the core behind both yep. agnosticism, skepticism, and let, atheism. Let me uh, stop you right there. We're probably going to go on, uh, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll continue this conversation, and we'll get into some more interesting uh, 
I guess, what's new in the debating world with the accretion? There's a so, few new things. Yeah. Hey, I'm Anderson Cooper. As a parent, you want to make sure that your child knows how to deal with bullying when they see it happening. And chances are they want to help, but they don't really know how. I'll teach them that the best thing to do is calmly walk away, find a teacher or other adult, and speak up. And do your part. Be that adult they can talk to and trust will listen. Join me to help stop bullying. Go to stopbullying.gov to find out more. Gosh, Darlene, it sure is amazing how much we have in common. I know, Larry. We both love three-car pileups. We both were built in Buffalo. And we both know wearing safety belts help save thousands of lives. Yeah, this is fascinating. Don't mind Vince. He's getting over a bad break. I know. Janet's picking up the pieces, too. They're in here. I wish they understood it's all worth it to get people to buckle up. Hey, lacerated lovebirds, I sense a major crush. <laughs> Could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Talk about head over heels. Rosita, mm -hmm. did you know there's a right way to sneeze? <laughs> Let's show them in my yeah. When you feel like your nose needs to give it at you, this is how you act, this is what you do. Lift your arm up high, bend it toward your face. Sneeze right there, I've got dirty pants. A chill, a chill, you I can do it for me. A chill, a chill. To learn more about preventing flu, visit flu.gov. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit BoostUp.org and take the first step. So, I just moved in with his family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born, and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. All right, well, welcome back uh, to The Road to Reason. Uh, our guest here is uh, John Shook, and we've been discussing a lot of interesting topics, covering from um, you know, apologetics, uh, with his, his debates with uh, William Lane Craig and, and uh, some neuroscience. Uh, what we're going to talk about next is going to be really interesting. Um, uh, William Lane Craig has been around for a very long time. Uh, we know his debating style. We know his evidential apologetics. Uh, what we're going to chat now is about what are people doing now to, you know, evolve their apologetics to try to subvert atheism, essentially. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just want to get uh, uh, John to ex uh, express his experiences. He's writing a new book on, on atheology, and maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, what's atheology? What's what is atheology? Yes. Yeah. Sounds like atheism. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's start right. with that. Sounds what is like atheology? That. Well, just as atheism is, uh, 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 you know, lack of interest or disbelief in theism, as say claims that God exists, atheology is the intellectual effort to defend atheism and to tackle theology. So, atheology. But what is atheology up to? Well, it has to be up to quite a bit. We spoke earlier how mm -hmm. natural theology tries to take advantage of new sciences, brain mm -hmm. sciences maybe, even quantum physics or Big Bang cosmology, whatever they can get their hands on. So, we have to keep up as well. Natural theology isn't staying the same, and so atheology has to be quick to skeptically call out the fallacies, the use of pseudoscience, and just frankly the bad reasoning behind a lot of these. But very, very clever intelligent people are cooking up some new 21st century recipes for defending religious belief. That's interesting. That's interesting. And, and yeah, there's always an evolution. 
Um, I want to bring uh, Rick uh, back in uh, real quick, and then I believe we have a call from uh, Stephanie from Northern Virginia. But Rick, uh, what, what's your, what are your thoughts on the evolution of apologetics? And you know, as a, you kind of sort of alluded that earlier, and, and we'll go with you, Rick, and then real quickly, then we'll take a call from Stephanie. Okay, uh, you put your finger on it. There's, there is an evolution in it. Uh, as we destroy their other arguments, they, some very clever people are out there coming up with new ideas and they just, you know, wait to be stepped on anew. But it begs the question, you know, <laughs> that's going to go on forever. And that's kind of a high level debate for the, the average people walking the street. It's, it's almost a non-issue. But the question is, are we winning? And uh, I think we are because our numbers are mushrooming. There are meetups uh, that are proliferating. And there's a meetup in Oklahoma City, for instance, that has over 1,100 members. National organizations are hiring lobbyists. If you check out the American Religious Identification Survey, demographics reflect cultural trends that are unprecedented in their speed of ba people abandoning religion. Youth are with us in massive numbers. Tithing in churches is way down. Preachers are abandoning the pulpit, as we saw with the clergy project. And we're getting normalized in the conversation. And we're doing that even as it's becoming embarrassing for the adamantly religious to spout their religion in public. Good, interesting concept. Um, I, wanna, I want John to kind of maybe respond to it a little bit, but first let's take the call from Stephanie. Can, you, uh, can we patch her through? Hello, Stephanie, are you there? All right, you guys maybe will let us know when she's coming in. If you can get her in, we'll uh, talk. Otherwise, yeah, she's she's. We can't seem to hear her in in the studio. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I'm just fine. So thanks for calling in. Uh, as you know, we have John Shook here on the air. Is there any questions you'd like to ask him? Well, I, I have one, and I'm not very informed as far as Catholic apologetics are concerned, other than having been raised Catholic. I've read far more of the Protestant apologetics. Does Dr. Shook find any significant differences in the arguments between Catholic and Protestant apologetics? Are, are the rhetorical devices different, or is it basically just slightly different flavors of exactly the same thing? That's a terrific question. If you do get interested, perhaps you have to talk to a Catholic neighbor or you find out that they are more on the Protestant side, you can lead them into questions. And so a bit of acquaintance with theology helps. And you're quite right. There's some differences. For example, you're far more likely to find somebody who reads the Bible literally over on the Protestant side. That's not been as much of an emphasis on the Catholic side for hundreds and hundreds of years. Catholics tend to be far more impressed with uh, evidence in the natural world of God's design. You'll hear these arguments also from Protestants, but the Protestants learned them from the Catholics. The Catholics aren't as much interested right now in trying as well to use arguments over free will and human depravity. You'll find that very heavy on the Protestant side. They will argue from the blackness of the human heart and how far we are from being able to be moral without God. Therefore, the argument goes, boy, do you need Jesus in your life. Oh, the Catholic theologians are happy to preach uh, Jesus, but they aren't as obsessed around uh, just the Jesus figure. So if you find yourself in a conversation about trying to understand the Bible literally, or you're trying to uh, you know, ar argue uh, uh, directly about uh, uh, Jesus, you may have to go there in a way that you don't necessarily have to go with a Catholic theologian. There are other differences I could go into, and, and we probably will actually, mm -hmm. as sure. we discuss yep. uh, a little bit more of these issues. But you're quite right to notice on the ground differences between people raised in the Catholic tradition and people raised in the Protestant tradition. And you've got to be able to listen for these nuances if you want to have dialogue with them. Th thank you. Thank you for that answer. Do you have any um, suggestions for resources for learning more about those differences? Is there anybody that actually talks about that? Well, the bookshelves down at the bookstore bulging with books written by Protestants and written by Catholics. So I suppose mm -hmm. there are introductory books there if you want to learn about that. 
Right now, there is not a large number of books written by atheists that are composed uh, for, for you know, trying to understand the, the, the nuances of these theologies. But much of the recent books you may be familiar with, of course, books by Dawkins and Dennett and Harris and Hitchens and so forth, and, and many more after them, do try to outline basic theological arguments that you're apt to hear from a neighbor, a family member, or a friend. And that has real power in the grassroots because they're hearing it from the pulpit, they're hearing it from their friends, they're hearing it from the religious echo chamber. So you can learn a lot from these uh, quote unquote basic or introductory uh, atheism books. Uh, and they would give you uh, what you really need to get into uh, these sorts of basic conversations. After that, um, I'm trying to compose books, actually. The book that was uh, already spoken of does get more deeply into theology. If you uh, have a friend who uh, uh, took a religion class or a, or a, or a seminary class, uh, you may be interested in going there with, uh, with that person over coffee. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much for the information. Sure, you're welcome. All right. Stephanie, thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And John, we were talking by the, before the show, maybe you can go into this a little deeper. Um, with, you know, atheists weren't the main problems for Catholics or for Protestants. It's always been sectarian uh, troubles between themselves. Can you talk about what's going on behind the scenes in politics right now? It's not just a theological nuance we have to pay attention to. You talked about how um, you're concerned that some people in new atheism might be just looking at the fundamentalists and harping on one set of problems while we're missing what's going on behind the scenes that's very important for everybody. We do have to pay attention because there are large political forces behind these different religious wings. The fundamentalists have proven themselves politically powerful and they have to be directly confronted both intellectually and politically. But they aren't the only game in town and in fact they may not be the most decisive game in town. Because we've already talked about how natural theology and the latest up-to-date arguments from uh, primarily Catholic theologians, although the Protestants will echo them, they are not interested in defending the Bible read literally. They are not interested in uh, uh, defending young earth creationism or any, any of that crazy business. They are instead interested in using the sciences against atheism. They're almost stealing a page for over 100 years. Us atheists and skeptics mm -hmm. have been able to say science is exclusively on our side. Science has been showing that non-belief is more rational, healthier, better for society, better for democracy. We've played that hand very well and to our advantage. As Rick mentioned, our numbers have been growing precisely because this has been very persuasive. Well, the natural theologians have not gone uh, you know, silent over this. They're fighting back. And the way that they're primarily fighting back is they're saying, well, actually, we want to use the best scientific knowledge, and we'll figure out how to use the best scientific knowledge about nature, about human beings, to defend religion. It's time for us to give back to the atheists what we've been taking for the last mm -hmm. hundred years. And so they've come up with some very clever research programs that's now starting to trickle down into political strategies for making religion the default reasonable position in every society, hmm. including secular societies. And they really do think that they have peer-reviewed academic research backed by scholars at Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard, et cetera. And they believe that they're going to gain the upper hand. They're certainly sounding very confident about their chances. Can you uh, maybe uh, tell us some of who some of these uh, leading uh, theologians and, and uh, sure. apologists are? That I are... brought a couple of examples mm -hmm. with me. Sure, maybe One can book is, uh, you can hold that the, up. Hold it up. This is the latest book by a Protestant theologian by the name of Alvin Plantiga. And Plantiga is... Uh, quite rightly acknowledged as a uh, leading uh, academic philosopher of religion and theologian, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he is reshaping natural theology in order to argue that if we take the sciences very seriously, they actually support religious belief, not atheism. One of his classic arguments that he's been working on for over 20 years, and which he very clearly explains in this fine book, is that if evolution 
is true. That is to say, if we are evolved through mechanical forces of just nothing but collections of atoms surviving for right how many millions and billions of years, then what that means is, is that it's just a purely a matter of luck that we have brains smart enough to figure out how nature works. But then he says, wait a minute, a matter of luck? That's no good justification. There has to be some real reason why we're smart enough to figure out evolution. And Plantinga has the answer. It must mm -hmm. be a god behind all of this. Yeah. In other words, if there wasn't a god making sure that evolution is guided towards creating just the right sort of very intelligent brain to figure out that evolution is true, right? The whole thing would collapse like a house sure. of cards. Very clever. If, if evolution is true, naturalism can't be the whole story. Oh, that, that's very only, clever. That, that's only because they make that assumption, they build it in there, that evolution is just chance. Right? They still right. choose to ignore what evolution really sure. is. There's a lot of talk about chanciness and randomness and probabilities. Furthermore, they also set a very high standard for epistemology, knowledge. Mm -hmm. How do we know what we know? This is an old game in theology. They assume that human beings have great knowledge, perfect knowledge, wonderful knowledge, certain knowledge. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then they look at our poor organic brains and say, how could such knowledge <laughs> be known by no, such puny, puny people? Little organic masses of matter must be a god behind yeah. it all, right? So you set the bar very high, and then you have to give all the credit to interesting, a god. Interesting. As we know, however, and as any scientist will tell you, science has knowledge, but it's fallible, it's revisable. We have to be skeptical about even our best scientific theories, should new evidence warrant it. In fact, science is changing and developing, it's evolving sure. and growing, just like, hmm, any biological organic thing would. Sure, well, sure. right, it's all pointing at the same brain behind it all. Uh, we're not as perfect as the theologians wished we were. Yeah, I'd like, like, oh, I was going to say, I'd like to get Rick back in real quick on this and, and maybe co comment on some, something that John said. And, and kind of tie it into, you know, the atheists are winning. What do you think this strategy is going to do for the atheist movement? Well, you know, guys, it's, it's no wonder they're running away from the Bible and trying to, <laughs> to use science and pseudoscience. Um, I happen to have a little book, oh, there it is, uh, in front of me. And one of the reasons they're having to bail on this book is this. And maybe we can do a whole show on this sometime. But in 2 Samuel uh, 24, verse 1, it says, The anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judea. Take a census. Mm -hmm. A few pages later in uh, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1, it says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to take a census of Israel. Direct contradiction. You, uh, talking about the same incident, by the way, and mentions the same places and the same people. So it's full of stuff like that. They can't get past. They have to resort to apologetics. That's historically not worked out for them. And every time they make the claim that because of something, then God must be, they've just made another unsubstantiated claim. They've supplied no proof. You know, I, th I think um, one thing that we've seen with apologetics all the time is that it really does go with some of the pseudoscientific methods that it, it knows where it wants to go, mm -hmm. and then it will cherry pick or make up whatever facts it needs to get to that pre-established conclusion in direct opposition to the way science should be working. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you sort of debunk it or point that out, it just comes back like a hydra with a slightly different head. Yeah, that's quite right. Mm -hmm. They want the scientific knowledge, but they don't want to have any respect for the hard scientific method that's right, behind it. Right. So, so you have, uh, you know, we talked about a little bit about Alvin uh, Plantinga. Who else is uh, doing this, uh, uh, this kind of work and in, in this new? I'm glad you asked. Yes. I brought a second you got book. got another book up. <laughs> it illustrates another portion of this new theology. It's uh, authored by a cognitive scientist and psychologist, uh, Justin Barrett, called Born Believers, the Science of Children's Religious Belief. And this is a, a part of a body of a work, much of which is peer-reviewed and respectable and quite credible in the academic journals. Barrett, however, is interested in using it for a theological agenda. 
which is not necessarily shared by the other academics doing reputable work into the psychology of religion and the evolutionary psychology behind why human beings are able to be religious. Yes, there has to be an evolutionary story behind all of our cognitive faculties mm -hmm. and behind the origin of something like religion. But Barrett is interested in supplementing that natural story with an additional account of why there must be some kind of necessary religious conviction behind it all. He's on a quest for what he calls the natural religion. Now get this, mm. the natural religion is somehow the religion that all humanity naturally seeks and almost all of them find. Hmm. What is this natural religion? Well, it's very bare bones and sketchy. There is a God who loves us, who created us. Sound familiar? Problem is, of course, is that the Chinese don't really believe in that sort of a supernatural uh -huh. creator being responsible for authoring the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Many indigenous religions, of course, don't use that sort of a, a, of a, a, a single lone super being. Mm -hmm. Monotheism across the history of humanity has, has been in the minority. You know, it's in the majority sure. now sure. because sure. of Christianity, Islam, uh, um, uh, certain versions of, of Hinduism which talk about one supreme God and so forth. But it hasn't always been so. So he has to play fast and loose with the scientific facts in sure. order to discern sure this one true natural religion that supposedly every human brain has been evolved to believe in. Mm -hmm. What an incredible story, but that's a theological story that goes well beyond the scientific facts. Right, right. So we have another caller, uh, Miriam from Virginia. Can we patch her through, please? Hi, how are you? Doing Hi. well. Hi, Miriam. Thanks for calling. Uh, well, thank you. I just wanted to ask you guys, um, how long have you been uh, airing on Channel 36? <laughs> we'll have to check with our producer. We've been running the show for approximately six or seven months now, and recently went from half an hour to an hour. Um, eventually, we're hopefully going to expand into you know, some other markets. Right now, we're um, you know, in the Washington, D.C. area. I think we might try to get it into public access up in New York. And, uh, but we can certainly check back with our producer and put that up on our website and you know, give out, share some of that information. We're going to try to start having a little more robust website where people can come, follow up on the show, see some extra comments. Um, somebody had asked Don if he had some uh, resource uh, recommendations. And we're going to start posting that kind of stuff uh, to make a little more information available to you guys. Well, I mean, that's great, and I'm really glad you guys are doing this through public, public access. So I just have one question for you. What do you say to those people who say that even if there isn't a God, they choose to believe in God anyway, just to be on the safe side when it all you know, ends? Pascal's yeah, wager. Yeah. Sure. Uh, one of the fathers of probability theory, Blaise Pascal from the uh, pre-Enlightenment days, came up with his wager. Well, maybe you can't rationally know that there is a God, but emotionally, whose side do you want to be on? Mm -hmm. In other words, if there is a God, the punishment for not believing is pretty terrible. Religions agree. Visions of hell populate most uh, religions. On the other hand, if you are a believer and you die and it turns out that's it, what's the worst that's happened? You've wasted a lot of Sunday mornings yeah. and you've been a better person. So Pascal says, that doesn't sound like a bad deal. So Pascal was a conservative thinker. Avoid worst case scenario. The problem with this argument is, of course, now you get into a theological arms race of which religion which can religion, design right. the worst case scenario. <laughs> and of course, I don't think that this is an ethically responsible way to uh, try to make people more moral. Uh, sure. We don't do this with children to terrify them exclusively into being moral. Uh, we probably shouldn't do it to each other as adults. It, it also really underestimates the opportunity cost. If you live your entire life assuming that there's the Christian God or whatever it is, and you do everything based on that, you know, you change the entire way that you live, your only life that you're ever going to have. Right, so right. there really is a cost there, to living as if there's this, you know, a God there. There absolutely is a cost. And I've, I've known personal friends that have gone, you know, basically lost their young adult life to to living in a way where they realize now was a complete waste of time. Rick, what do you have to say about this? And uh, you know, Pascal's wager. How many times have you had to debate that with people? 
Well, it <laughs> seems to come up in every debate. And, you know, it seems to me like uh, the God, certainly of the Southern Baptist, the one true God, uh, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. think he would fall for that if you were just, you know, covering your, your butt by believing in Jesus, um, you know, as a way of just covering your spread. So it's, it's insincere, and I think uh, I think uh, God, a real God would have, or certainly the God of the Southern Baptist would find a special place in hell for you for falling for that. <laughs> that's interesting, right. Uh, Miriam, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I think this is, kind of ties in with what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, Pascal's wager has been a great tool uh, for biologists to use for a long time, and it, and it really appeals to some, some, a very deep sense, as John said, to an emotional uh, you know, and a lot of people really think about that, and a lot of people seem to think uh, more, it seems, with their emotions than to do with their logic and, and reason. So absolutely, and, and, but I think, I think people are smartening up a little bit. I think, uh, you know, people are starting to realize, well, yeah, I mean, if you put things in perspective, how many gods are there? I mean, we have to live our life to, to make sure that we don't go in any hell. Man, we, <laughs> we would be right. uh, very, very Pas- busy indeed. <laughs> Pascal living in, uh, in 17th century France had the advantage of everyone around him being Catholic. Sure, uh, sure. The argument doesn't fly anymore. Uh, Marion, we're going to be finishing up really soon here. Did you have any last questions for Don? No, thank you, and best of luck to you and your show. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks thank for you. calling thank you in. Much. Wonderful. Uh, were there any other particular topics you wanted to cover? We've got you know, a minute and a half left. Anything else? I think, we... Rick, did you have a quick question? or? Uh, just a quick question. You talked before about how they like to dismiss science because uh, with the bogus claim that science says we're just a big accident. There's a terrific book I read several years ago called Complexity by Mitch Waldrop. Mm-hmm. And in this book, he makes the case for uh, abiogenesis and uh, the strong case that we're not an accident, we're an inevitability mm-hmm. on a, a planet-sized petri dish with no biological comp- uh, competition, amino acids everywhere. It's an inevitability that something more complex was gonna come along. Sure. So we're just sure. a, a, a current level of uh, progress. Absolutely. That's right, that's right. We continually run into, as you know, Rick, and anyone who's talked with grassroots folks, the religious are always interested in the God of the gaps. You know that, right? right. Something science can't explain. Well, that's a job for a God to do. Problem is, is that of course, science is eliminating the gaps, just like it's filling in gaps in the fossil record. So this is a losing game in the, wrong, in the long run. And on that note, I think yep. we're out of here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank we'll see much. you next time on Road to Reason. Thank you much.